uh, section 14.A, finding the equilibrium concentrations. So what we had been talking about was uh, how to write an equilibrium expression, how to calculate the equilibrium constant, um, and we looked at uh, how to predict which direction a reaction is going to go with that, with that reaction quotient. Yeah, reaction quotient, the Q, the big capital Q thing. So now we're going to look at um, how to calculate the equilibrium concentrations. Um, this is a more useful type of calculation. Other people have calculated many, many rate constants, and so we can look them up, and that's, that's awesome, and then we can use the rate constant and the expression to calculate what the, uh, e the, what the equilibrium concentrations are in our particular reaction. And these fall into two types of problems. The first is where we know the equilibrium constant, and we know all but one of the equilibrium concentrations. This is the easier, easier thing to do the calculation on. All you have to do is take those known values, plug it into the equilibrium expression, and solve for the unknown. Not a big deal. How often do you think we know all but one of the equilibrium concentrations? Not very often. Because then you have to mul uh, measure multiple species without disturbing the equilibrium. So this is an easier calculation, but it's, it doesn't really happen that much in real life. The second case is what is more common. Um, here we know the initial concentrations of the reactants and products, and we know the equilibrium constant, and the way we solve this is with a nice table. Okay. So let's look at the first method. Um, we'll just do an example. We've got diatomic iodine decomposing at high temperatures. I don't know why there's brackets around that. That's dumb. To form iodine atoms according to this reaction, equilibrium constant is given there. So if we have an equilibrium mixture with a concentration of iodine being 0.1 molar, what's the equilibrium concentration of the iodine atoms? So here we know there's only two species, right? We know the con equilibrium concentration of all but one of them, and we know the equilibrium constant. So then we have to write the equilibrium expression and put the numbers in. So Kc, <laughs> uh, I don't know what I was using that for. Mm, let's go with black. Black is good, but not there. What's the equilibrium expression for this one? I squared over just I, right? So there's different ways to approach this. You can put the numbers in and then rearrange it, or you can rearrange it and then put the numbers in. Um, in a simple situation like this, I think it's better to rearrange it and stick the numbers in. Um, but you guys are pretty good with math, so you could probably do pretty much anything you wanted to here. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm going to plug the numbers in. 0 0.011 is K equals, and I squared, we're trying to find I. We leave that alone, and then we've got down here, we've got 0.1. So then to solve that, we're going to take the 0.011 and multiply by 0.1. We end up with I squared being equal to 0 0.0011. And then we take the square root of that. And the equilibrium concentration of the iodine atoms is 0 0.0. Three, three. And the unit there is molarity. Any questions?
The other type of calculation is more common, and we need to use an ice table, a specific procedure. Since we went over this on Monday night with that worksheet and learning to do uh, solving on our calculators, this should be review, but we're going to go through it anyway. So what we're going to do for these sorts of problems is we're going to set up an ice table with the initial concentrations, because that's what this sort of problem has. You've got initial concentrations or pressures. Remember, if it's all gases, we can use pressures instead. And we're going to use the K. We're going to add, um, sorry, skipped one. We're going to represent the changes in concentrations in terms of X. And when we do that, we have to consider the stoichiometry of the chemical equation. Then you take the initial and the change rows, and you add them together to get the equilibrium concentrations in terms of X. You put those into the equilibrium expression, and you put K in there, and you solve for X. So let's do an example. Here's a simple example. Little reaction here, A goes to 2B. K is 0.33. Initial concentration of A is 1 molar. So we make up our ice table here. We've got A and we've got B. And I personally, I really like to put the stoichiometry in here and basically use the equation as the heading for your table. So we start out with A being 1. It doesn't tell us what B is. B is a reactant. So we are supposed to assume that there's no reactant present initially. And then we identify how are these species going to change. Well, the reactant that's initially present is going to decrease because some of that is going to be converted into product. One mole of A will produce two moles of B. So we'll call this minus X. It's going to decrease by X. And as it decreases by x, the product increases by 2x because of the 2 coefficient in the equation. Everybody see how that works? To get these guys down here, I'm just going to add the two rows above. So I've got 1 minus x. That's my equilibrium concentration for A. And I've got 0 plus 2x, so that's just 2x. Now we write our equilibrium expression. K is equal to B squared over A. And then we're going to put in numbers. So K is 0.33. And these aren't, um, these are expressions, not numbers. So the equilibrium concentration of B is 2X. So we stick that in here and we get 2X squared. And A is 1.0 minus x. There we have an equation and we have to solve that. So I'm going to take the bottom here and multiply over here and distribute the 0.33. I'm going to get 0.33 um, minus 0.33x in, and then that's going to be equal to 4x squared. Or you can use the solver function on your calculator. Like on, the test for this, will we be able to use like our fancy calculators? On, on the exams, you will be able to use your fancy calculators. On the final exam, you will not. But the questions there are intended for people who do not have a programmable calculator at their disposal. Um, they could give you stuff like this. Um, yeah, they could. So, did I do this one? I can't remember. I don't think I did. You would use the uh, quadratic formula to solve this guy, which I know is just not that much fun. Or if you use the solver on your calculator, you get 0 0.0029. So x equals 0 0.0029. Different instructors have different approaches to the use of the calculator. The calculator is here. 
it's, I mean, if you're out in the workplace, you're not going to need to use the quadratic formula to solve a quadratic equation. You just aren't. You're going to use the calculator, or you're going to use Wolfram Alpha, right? And if we could figure out a way to do Wolfram Alpha in here, that would be fine. The problem is it remembers what other people have typed in. And so if you get 30 students during an exam bombarding Wolfram Alpha, then it remembers and, and helps everybody else out. So we can't do that. <laughs> Darn. Unless the first person did it wrong. Unless the first person did it wrong, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Any questions about that, that one? Okay, let's do a real one. Okay, consider this reaction. The reaction starts with only the product, concentration given, and no reactants. Find the equilibrium concentrations of all three species. Okay, so we're going to set up a nice table. Um, I'm actually going to do this just because I find it amusing. I'm going to just draw it right there. Cheating. It's not a test. Ice. So, what's the initial concentration of the NO? I did not erase that. It's right here. The NO is 0 0.0100 0, 0 molar, and it said, I did erase that part, no <laughs> reactants, so these are both zero. Those are our initial concentrations. Then we'll use X to describe how these are going to change. So you have two choices. You can follow the pattern where we would use minus X for the reactants and plus X for the products. Or you could recognize, oh, wait a minute, this can only go in the reverse direction. This one's going to go down, and those two are going to go up. You're going to come up with the same number. The sign will be different. Sometimes you could end up with x being a negative number because you didn't recognize which direction the, the reaction was going to go. You will never end up with an equilibrium concentration that is less than 0. Okay. So which method do you want to use? Should we say that this is going to decrease by x? Let's do that. Is it going to decrease by 1x or by 2x? 2x. So this is minus 2x, and then what should we call the other ones? Plus x. Because for every two of these, we're going to get one of those and one of those. And then we put in, we just add those together, 0 plus x, 0 plus x, and this ends up being 0 0.0, that's not a 0. 1, 0, 0, minus 2x. So our equilibrium expression, um, we've got Kc is equal to NO squared over N2 times O2. The constant is 0 0.00. zero. Oh my. No. It's tiny on my screen. It's really tiny. Someone needs to buy me a regular full-size iPad. This is just like an oversized phone. There's the constant. And this is our expression for the NO concentration. So that's going to be squared, 0 0.0100 minus 2x, the quantity squared. And this is divided by x times x. Well, x times x is x squared, so let's just call it that. So I plug that equation into the solver on my calculator. You could also do it with the quadratic formula, but that's just so tedious. Um, and I'm coming up with 0 0.0045 for x is that the answer that the question is asking for. So 
I know, I wrote over it. What are the equilibrium concentrations of N2O2 and NO? So this is the answer to two of the questions. That equals the concentration of N2, which equals the concentration of O2. Yeah, and then to find the calcu calculation, to find the concentration of the NO, we put X into that little expression, 0 0.0100 minus 0 0.0045. Point zero one minus point zero zero four five. Oh yeah. Times two. Yeah. I'm getting one times ten to the minus third. Anybody else? So 1.0 times 10 to the minus third. Yeah. And that's molarity. Any questions? Yes. Let's do one with partial pressures. Remember, if the reaction is all in the gas phase, we can use partial pressures and the equilibrium constant with respect to pressure in the same way that we used concentrations. So here we have a reaction mixture at 25 degrees, initially containing both reactants, and each of them has a partial pressure of 0 0.150 atmospheres. There's no product. Find the equilibrium pressures of all three substances, and we're given Kp. Kp. So I'll, I'll not cover it up this time. So there's I2 and Cl2 and 2 ICL. And initial, now these are pressures instead of concentrations, but this is 0 0.150 and 0 0.150 and 0. And then what are the changes for these? Minus x, minus x and plus 2x. And so then at equilibrium, I don't think I can write that small, 0 0.150 minus x, 0 0.150 minus x, and 2x. There's no x missing. So Kp equals the pressure of ICL, the partial pressure, squared, divided by the pressure of I2 times the pressure of Cl2. Well, second, oh, pressure of ICL. The pressure of the product squared divided by the pressure of the reactants multiplied by each other. So we get 81.9 is equal to 2x squared over, and since those are the same, that ends up being 0 0.150 minus x, the quantity squared. Any questions? Yes? Um, would they ever make us go back and forth between, like, so we have k and p right now? They give us that one, and they want us to do it the other way we had last time, like, to, like, find the, I, the molar. I could see them doing um, 
like giving you pressures and KC. Because we learned how you can convert one to the other by looking at the equation, right? And so I could see them doing that. Um, I don't think that they would ask you to um, find the, the concentrations for this, but you could. Okay. You know, if they're giving you the temperature, um, and I think, well, you would have to make an assumption. You would have to assume a total pressure. Maybe you wouldn't. Yeah, there, there'd be some issues in there. You'd have to figure them out. But they could, yes. See, that's the fun about 1B, is that you can get these creative problems that make you work. Okay, so again, we could do that the old-fashioned way, or we could just put it into the solver. So I'm going to do the solver here. And you do your solver, and hopefully we will all solve together and come up with the same number. Divided by 0.25 minus x quantity squared. I'm getting 0.123. Anybody else? So x equals 0 0.123. Find the equilibrium pressures of all three substances. So the pressure of um, the iodine and the chlorine is going to end up being the same. Wait, I don't want to do concentrations. PI2 is going to equal the partial pressure of Cl2. And what's that going to be? It's going to be 0.15 minus 0.123, which is what, 0 0.27? 0 0.27. 0 0.027. That's what happens when I do math in my head. And then the pressure of the product, the ICL, is 2 times x, which is 0 0.246 atmospheres. Yes? Is this a coincidence that the initial pressure is exactly the same as the equilibrium pressure? Say that again? Is it just a coincidence that the, the initial pressure is exactly the same as the equilibrium pressure? Total pressure, no. No, it isn't. Because we started with two moles of gas, and we end up with two moles of gas. So regardless of which direction the reaction goes, you have the same total number of moles of gas. Okay, sweet. If the number of moles of product and reactant gases is different, then the total pressure could change. Okay. And that, that causes other sorts of issues. Yes? I was doing my solver. How did you get the 127 uh, um, I plugged it into here. I plugged x in. 0. 0.150 minus x. Oh, okay. gotcha. And 0. 0.150 minus x and 2x. Gotcha. Okay? That's so where you plug the 0. 0.123 yeah. into those. Yeah. So lots of little steps, but nothing horrendous, right? Correct. There's some blank stares from people that I don't think they agree with me. So we also did this a little on that worksheet, simplifying approximations. With some equilibrium problems, we can approximate things and greatly simplify the calculations without significantly affecting the accuracy of the result. Okay, so the one we're going to talk about is the assumption that x is small. So let's think it through. If the equilibrium constant is small, that means the reaction does not proceed very far to the right. If the initial reactant concentration is large, then we can assume that x is small in comparison. If x is small in comparison, then the reactant concentration is essentially unchanged. And this really bothers some people. Um, I've made up my own analogies for this, but I like the one in the book. It's like weighing yourself with a penny in your pocket and then taking the penny out and weighing yourself again. Can your bathroom scale tell the difference? No, it can't. 
Does that mean the penny has no mass? No, it just means that its mass is insignificant in comparison with the mass of your whole body. So in here, in this sort of an approximation, we're saying that the reactant concentration is like you and that change is like the penny. It doesn't really make a difference. But we're going to go ahead and figure out what the mass of the penny is anyway. When we're done with this, we're going to check the assumption. And this is really important because you can't always tell when you're starting the problem if the assumption is going to be okay or not. You check it by comparing the value of x that you calculated to the numbers that you subtracted it from. Pick the smallest one you're subtracting it from. That would be like a reacting concentration. And if that ratio is 5% or less, the, the approximation is considered valid. I know this is probably just like, you know, you're in school, you're in college kind of thing, but if we're going to just make the assumption and have to do it the right way anyway, it's fine to do it. Well, you don't want to make the assumption if you're going to have to do it the right way anyway. Well, we have to do it the right way to find it. No, no, you don't, because you're not comparing x to the real value of x, the thorough way. You're taking the value of x that you calculated using the approximation, and you're comparing it to the initial concentration that you're subtracting it from. So you're comparing, it's like, okay, I've got something in my pocket, I'm going to weigh myself, and I know what my mass is. I want to know, does it make a difference if I take my cell phone out? Oh, okay. So we're going to use an approximation to say it doesn't, and we're going to figure out the mass of the cell phone a different way. Then I'm going to compare the mass of my cell phone to my mass and see, is it 5% of my mass or is it less? If it's 5% or less, it doesn't matter. It is 5% or less, sadly. <laughs> no, that, would, that really wouldn't be good, would it? Anyway, let's do an example. So this is a simple example, then we'll do a real example. So here, again, our little simple uh, equilibrium A goes to 2B. We have an equilibrium constant. Um, we look at this equilibrium constant and we see that this is small, right? It's less than 1. And we're given that the initial concentrations of concentration of A is 1 molar, the initial concentration of B is 0. So we're starting with just reactant and no product. And then we can set up the ice table. And here, we, this would be 1 minus x, and this would be 0 plus 2x, so 2x. And we're looking at this small equilibrium, and 1 molar is a pretty high concentration. And so we're going to use the x is small approximation. So write out the whole thing. This is b squared over a. So the equilibrium constant, 3.5 times 10 to the minus fifth, is equal to uh, 2x, the quantity squared, over 1.0 minus x. The approximation says x is small compared to 1. It's like taking a penny out of your pocket. Subtracting that is not going to really affect. And so we're going to say, no, that's just 1. That's our approximation. This makes the problem much simpler. So now we have 3.3 times 10, 10 to the minus 5 is equal to 4x squared. And to solve that, we just take 3.3. 3 e e minus 5. Um, it's going to be divided by 4. And we'll take the square root of that. And we come up with x being equal to 0 0.0029. To check our approximation, we take 0. Point, oh, I shouldn't do it over there. There's not going to be enough room. I'll do it over here. 0 0.0029 divided by 1, the number that we are subtracting it from. We take what we got for x, divide it by this, multiply by 100, and we get 0.29%. The change is 0.29% of the concentration. 
doesn't matter. Okay, so just for fun, let's do it on the solver and see what we come up with. 3.3 EE minus 5 equal to 4 times x squared divided by the quantity 1 minus x. So doing it the more exact way, we come up with x being 0 0.002. Don't rotate on me. I bent over and the iPad rotated. <laughs> I can't see this stupid calculator. Is that an 8? Eight? 868? Eight, six, eight? Yeah. 2868. Okay, and this one over here, if we if we carried more significant figures, was two eight seven two. Now, when you subtract those from one, it doesn't change the one, not with the precision that we have in these sorts of measurements. We've got two significant figures going on, and and they're going to round to the same thing. Any questions? You're welcome to use the solver to do a problem like this. But you need to know how to do the approximation, because I would be willing to bet money that there's a question like this on that ACS final. And you don't want to have to drag out the quadratic formula to solve it. Okay, So know how to do the approximation. Here's another one. Decomposition of hydrogen disulfide. Here we've got um, reactant concentration of 0.01, and one of the products is 0.1, and the sulfur is 0 at 800 degrees Celsius. This is a small equilibrium constant. Again, I forgot to subscript the C. I can handle one. One thing like that. Oh, but there's two. Okay, so I fixed my, my mistakes there. Let's do this guy. So 2H2S, and we've got 2H2, and we've got S2. And initial concentrations, the H2S is 0 0.100, the H2 is 0 0.100, and the S is 0. How are those going to change? So this is going to be minus 2x, and this one's going to be plus 2x, and this one's going to be plus 2x. No, no, no. You are paying attention. That's good. You were, you were talking so much, I wasn't sure. Hush, hush. You're distracting me. Did I do that right? So K equals the um, hydrogen squared, 0 0.100 plus 2x, times the sulfur, which is plain old x, divided by the first one, the quantity squared. OK? And this is equal to 1.67 times 10 to the minus 7. That's a nice little mess, isn't it? We have a small equilibrium constant, and so we have um, we have 0.1 here and we have 0.1 there. Those are relatively large concentrations. Let's try the x is small approximation and see what happens. 
This one's a little bit questionable, though, because we're not just looking at reactants going to products. We've got some of each, and so it's like, well, let's we'll see what happens. So the X is small approximation says that X is small enough relative to this that adding 2X isn't going to matter. Actually, let's just do it like this. So we're just going to get rid of that part. And then down here, subtracting 2X isn't going to matter either. So those point ones then, we've got point one squared and point one squared. Those are going to cancel out. So those are going to cancel out. And so we're going to end up with x equals 1.67 times 10 to the minus 1. That did simplify the solving, didn't it? Just a wee bit. So let's see if... It's 5% or less. All right, you can probably guess that it is, but I'm going to check it anyway. So 1.67 times 10 to the minus 7 divided by what we're subtracting it from, which is 0.1 times 100. And, yeah, it's, uh, it's a little less than 5%. It's 1.67 times 10 to the minus 4th percent. Wow. Right? Yeah. So really, really small. So the equilibrium concentration of sulfur is just this. That equals the S2. I don't think these brackets are supposed to be there. I don't think so. Yeah, but it's asking for the equilibrium concentration of S2, not the equilibrium concentration of the concentration of S2. It's a sad, sad peek into my mind. Okay, so here's some notes, just some things I want to remind you of. Um, the concentrations must be expressed in moles per liter. I wouldn't put it past anybody to give you the concentration in some other unit trying to trick you. In Chem 3A, I do not intentionally try to trick my students on exams. In Chem 1B, I may intentionally try to trick you. So you've been warned. If you're doing partial pressures, it has to be in atmospheres. You make sure you use the appropriate equilibrium constant, Kp or Kc. You can use moles in place of the concentration or partial pressure sometimes. If the moles of reactants in the chemical equation is equal to the moles of product, then you're okay. And you can just use the moles. There was one like that on the, the worksheet we did. So if you have a reaction like this, A plus B in equilibrium with C plus D, there are two moles of reactants. There are two moles of product. If I use moles instead of molarity, the volume cancels out, and we're fine. If it's something like this, 2C, Again, two moles of reactants, two moles of product. Still fine. You can use moles instead of concentration. But if it's something like this, two moles of reactant, one mole of product, the volume doesn't cancel out, and you have to use molarity. Safe thing is to always use molarity. But some of you, you know, just are risk takers, so go ahead. And then the X is small approximation does not mean that X is zero. Sometimes students get that misconception. Oh, well, we're saying that x is small compared to this, so x must be zero, right? The penny was small compared to my mass, but this penny still has mass. So we're still going to find what x is, and it's not going to be zero. It might be crazy, crazy small, but it won't be zero. So we can get rid of it, we don't replace it with zero, that will give us a funky answer? What we're doing is we're getting rid of it in any addition or subtraction forms. But if it's by itself, you can't get rid of it. Because if you add it to a number, it's not significant. If you subtract it from a number, it's not significant. But when you have it all by itself, it's significant. Yes? Um, so what we were doing is when, when like K was really, really, really small. And that, mm -hmm. that means it favors the reactants. Favors the reactants. So if X is, I mean, K is really, really, really big, and so it means it favors the well, if you had um, K being really large, and you give it the 
and you were given, and you were starting with products, then basically you're doing the same thing and looking at it backwards, right? But if you have K being large, and you're starting with reactants and no products, it's, it's X is going to be very large, and you can't do that. It's possible if the problem is set up the right way, you could do it. Okay. Any? Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, so if we had different initial concentrations, then would we have to do the five percent approximation for every single one? Um, you wouldn't need to do every single one. You could just do the smallest one. Because the smallest one would give you the largest percent, right? Okay. Any other questions?